You're listening to KOOP Radio, KVRX HD3, Austin, streaming at koop.org, radio for people, not for profit. This is Volumes, the Austin Public Library radio show. I'm Mike Wheat. And I'm Kanye Lyons. Each week on the show, we go beyond the stacks and get to know the people and the programs that make the library a hub of learning technology and inspiration for our community. True, true. And thanks again to the folks out riding on the air for telling their listeners about our show. As I mentioned, today we are going to have a conversation with Susan Ritterizer, curator of archives and manuscripts at the Austin History Center. She, along with Mike Miller, the manager of the History Center, co-authored the book titled Historic Movie Houses of Austin, a very exciting topic for today's show. Susan is a former filmmaker and a movie buff, but before we get started, let's learn a little bit about your background. So, uh, who is Susan? Yeah. Where are you from? God, and who what am brought you I? To uh, oh. Um, oh gosh. Uh, I moved here maybe 24 years ago to come to, uh, the library and information science school at the time to study film preservation. Um, nice. yeah. And it just so happened at that time that UTI school, at the time the Library and Information Science School, was one of the only schools in the country that even offered a film preservation program. So it was in its infancy, this whole movement toward, you know, preserving film and seeing the importance of that. It was pretty cutting edge. UT was one of the only schools. So I really had no ambitions, honestly, in the beginning of being a librarian or an archivist. It was more the film preservation. And then maybe studying some film theory, studying some film production. Um, I had been in a doctoral program at Arizona State in psychology. So I was a psych major. And, um, well, you know, there's a lot of psychology in film. Yeah. And, um, but I decided to leave that program. And after that, I was like, gosh, what else do I like doing in life? What else do I care about besides psychology? And I was like, I like film. Yeah. Okay. And then film preservation somehow got around to that, read a book many years ago called Nitrate Won't Wait, Mm -hmm. um, which is a classic now. um, And that just sort of inspired me um, to move to Austin. So that title's in reference to the fact that nitrate, old film, will ignite. That's right. It will (laughs) self Under certain temperatures. That's right. So how did you find yourself interested in this at the beginning of the curve um, to even know that this was a growing... You know, things to, to archive. I mean, how did you... I um, initially had been, um, I guess, from being from the East Coast and being from New York, I was always interested in my roots. Um, it's important to know your ethnicity and your background there. Are you German? Are you Czech? Are you Irish? And so that was like a big deal when I was growing up. And then I had started doing a lot of genealogy research with my old uncle. So I was kind of a weird younger person interested. So I was always the kid going, where are we from? What does the name Ritterizer mean? You know, and like this is the older adult saying, uh, and me asking asking them these questions, and I'm like, honey, we didn't ask questions like this in our day, children, you know. Uh, and that's why so, psychology was weak then. <laughs> yeah, um, so I did a lot of genealogy research before even coming to Texas or even getting involved in film preservation. So I started out, I guess, as a genealogist. It was my own personal interest and my family background. That was important um, from where I was from. Yeah, abstractly, oh, for sure, you could see the connection between psychology and the history of things and how it affects us long term yeah so maybe even subconsciously you were marrying the two maybe so yeah well my own our our family history and and background and where did it all start and why so where did it all start and why (laughs) so you're asking about the book well yeah we're here to talk about uh, that's right the genesis as mike and i call it um of this uh book um, so this book was based on um, a, um, an exhibit that we did back in 2012 called The First Picture Shows, which was a take on the movie The Last Picture Show. Um, so it's called The First Picture Shows, Historic Movie Houses of Austin or something like that. And um, it was very successful, that exhibit. Uh, We did two moderated panel discussions um, associated with that exhibit. One was for the opening of the exhibit in spring of 2012, and then another one, because it was so popular, we did at the State Theater that summer, and I moderated both of those panels. So somewhere in between those panels, I cannot, Mike and I, neither of us can remember exactly when this was, but at some point, 
the the folks who worked on the exhibit. It was Mike, myself, it was Steve, Grace, the exhibit's team, uh, got a behind the scenes tour of the Paramount Theater. Because I, I remember Grace like snapping pictures of like the famous Houdini hole. And you, if you want to know what that is, you have to read the book. Yeah. Um, so it was after that behind the scenes tour, we were standing in front of the Paramount and I said to Mike, you know, we've been doing a lot of research for this exhibit and nowhere, anywhere have, do I see any publication related to historic movie houses. Um, there's tons of books on film production, indie film production in Austin, indie filmmakers, but nothing at all. We had, and we drew off of this in the exhibit that we had one master's thesis written like in the 50s or 60s, unpublished from UT, um, to go on that helped us with the real early film in Austin, like in the early 1900s. But other than that, nothing. Hmm. So I said to Mike, standing there in front of the Paramount, um, someone should write a book on this topic. And I'd like to take on this challenge. And and by the way, he remembers none of this conversation. (laughs) (laughs) So he claims, I said, I'd like to take on this topic. And he said, you know, I've been interested. I've been thinking about the same thing myself. So, this in combination with around this time, I had also been pitching to him another idea, which is repurposing. At this time, we really weren't doing a lot with our exhibits. So, to make an exhibit at the History Center, it takes a lot of time and resources. Absolutely. It's months uh, because it's all in-house material we're using uh, from the archives. So it takes you know months of research, planning, writing, you know, pulling materials, writing the text. So we have all this fantastic information on the shared drive from all these different exhibits, and it's just sitting there. So I had pitched an idea to him about creating coffee table books, like repurposing the material, creating coffee table books. And the getting, hardest of the work's done. Yeah. yeah, and getting worldwide distribution. And for our exhibits, like putting them out there to the world, giving them another life, mm-hmm. and, um, and then making some money in the process. Um, because as you know, as a part of the city mm. and division of the public, we are under-resourced, understaffed. Yeah. Absolutely. We all are. So, you know, obviously the sales are through our friends group. We don't get anything. But it would be a way of then somehow trying to generate some revenue as well and, you know, reaching the world. Right. Larger um, exposure. Absolutely. And, you know, we do have traveling exhibits since then. Those have developed and so on. But again, those are pretty much local. That's so fascinating. Um We just have time for one more question um, before we are going to take a short break. Um, So can you tell me a little bit about like the source materials that went that were used to create the exhibit that was then used to to write the book. Right. So, you know, we have millions of items in the collection, but the um, several of the collections we drew from heavily were the Trans-Texas uh, theater records. Uh, those were donated by Jay Podolnik. The Podolniks own Trans-Texas. Um, they own several movie theaters in town in the 60s and 70s, including the Americana, which is now the Yarborough Branch Library. Over off Hancock. Right. Yep. The South Southwood, the Aquarius Four, so he generously had donated uh, material because of the exhibit. We got those in. Um, J.J. Hegman Papers um, was another collection. We have the Paramount Theater Records, um, you know, and then uh, AF Photographs. So we pulled from a variety of sources. And then, as I was telling Kanya earlier, what really helped us in... So... The exhibit really just created the framework for the exhibit, but what really helped us suss out more material, more photographs, and stories to tell was that um, historical um, uh, Austin Statesman database online. We did not have that when we did that exhibit in 2012, but for this for this book... Boy, it was a lifesaver. There it was. It was a lifesaver. All right. Well, it sounds like we've got a lot to keep talking about. We're okay. going to continue our conversation <laughs> yes. with Susan Ridreiser about historic movie houses in Austin. But first, three of our favorite librarians are going to tell us about some of the community groups, activities, and events happening at Austin Public Libraries all across town. My name is Blair Parsons, and I'm a reference librarian at the Falk Central Library. 
Saturday morning, May 20th, the Terrazas Branch Library will host Delving Into Mysticism, Yeats, Tarot, and Poetics. This Badger Dog writing workshop, led by Micah Rule, will focus on the long history between poetry and tarot cards. The writing workshop is from 1030 to 1230, Saturday, May 20th, at the Terrazas Branch Library, and tarot cards will be provided. As part of the My Library Keeps Me Healthy initiative, one-stop assistance will be offered at the Falk Central Library, Tuesday, May 23rd, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Social services, health screenings, and computer help will all be available. This one-stop assistance is available every Tuesday at the Falk Central Library from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Hey there, Austin. Teen Program Specialist Michael Harley from the downtown Falk Central Library here with a rundown of teen and tween events happening across the Austin Public Library system this week. We've got another great week for teen book clubs. Starting things off on Thursday, May 11th at 5.30 p.m., the Little Walnut Creek Branch will host their Teen Manga Book Club. Participants can explore and celebrate a new manga series, along with trivia, button making, and snacks. Due to mature content, this program is recommended for ages 13 to 18. Also on Thursday, May 11th at 7 p.m., the Yarborough Branch Teen Book Club turns their focus towards fantasy with Jonathan Stroud's The Amulet of Samarkand, book one of the popular Bartimaeus trilogy. On Friday, May 12th at 4 p.m., the Southeast Branch wraps up their Shaping Spaces art workshop series for grades 4th through 9th, exploring the overlap of innovation and nature with STEAM-based programming. The final project will focus on Makey Makey Kits that turn the most unusual everyday objects into pieces of technology. On Saturday, May 13th at 2 p.m., the University Hills Branch continues their weekly Saturday movie matinee series with Jason Bourne, the fifth film in the Bourne series that follows Matt Damon's title character still on the run from the CIA. Jason Bourne is rated PG-13. Finally, on Tuesday, May 16th at 6.30 p.m., the Housen Branch Teen Book Club will be discussing Six of Crows, the start of the new Dregs book series from writer Leigh Bardugo, best-selling author of the Grisha Trilogy. Didn't catch all of the finer points? More details for these and additional library programs can be found at library.austintexas.gov events. This is Ann Minner, Youth Librarian at the Old Quarry Branch. I get to highlight a few Austin Public Library events happening for children this week. The Austin Public Library loves celebrating children and literature, and we have a particularly good time during the Dia de los Niños, Dia de los Libros celebrations we plan. On Saturday, May 20th, at the Ruiz Branch from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., the library presents the Family Literacy and Information Literacy Celebration, a day full of family learning with music, stories, literacy games, and coding, along with other STEAM activities. We will start the day with a children's concert of classical chamber music and storytelling by the Austin Camerata. Other activities will include online resources scavenger hunt, playing with circuits, online and offline coding, and a free book. We will also be signing folks up for library cards just like every day. Additional information about this great party is at library.austintexas.gov slash events. Austin Book Arts Center is a new nonprofit teaching book arts to promote literacy. Our classes include bookbinding, letterpress printing, calligraphy, book repair, and decorative papermaking. More info at atxbookarts.org. We're back with the Austin Public Library radio show, Volumes, to continue our discussion with Susan Ritterizer about Historic Movie Houses of Austin, which is a book based on an exhibit at the Austin History Center. Um, hi, Susan. Hello. <laughs> so um, chapter six of your book lands on the subject of um, civil rights movement mm -hmm. and segregation. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? I would love to. So of all the chapters, so the, Mike and I divided up the chapters. He wrote some and I wrote some. So this was one of the chapters I wrote. I had the privilege of writing, and I, I feel like it's the most important chapter because it's the most timely, really, especially in today's political and social climate. Um, now, we did touch on this in the exhibit, but I was able to source a lot more material, photos, and stories out because of that historical statesman database yes. and some you know, other avenues of investigation. And my favorite story um, to talk about is the, um, the, the, the theater stand-ins. Um, 
This started back in about 1960 when, well, let's, let me preface this by saying all businesses in Austin and in the South um, were segregated. This was totally legal. Being from New York, this is kind of a strange um, idea for me, mm -hmm. but so back in the 50s and 60s, every all the businesses were segregated, including movie theaters. Now, there were black-owned and operated uh, movie theaters, the first one being in, starting in 1920. The, they were located in the Negro Business District at that time, somewhere on the east side of East Avenue, which is now the IH-35, and so on. The first um, Spanish language, all Spanish language theater was built in 1947 by Eddie Joseph. So there were, you know, um, so I can go on and on, but uh, so so that's why I'm prefacing it by saying movie theaters were segregated back in 1960. So a group of UT students, uh, headed by um, an individual named Chandler Davidson at the time, a student at UT, he was a journalist, he was a bigwig on campus, he was a writer for the Daily Texan, and he was very outspoken on civil rights and desegregation. Um, he headed up this group called the Students for Direct Action. So they had first started with lunch counter sit-ins, sit uh, you know, in and around 1960 when the civil rights movement was really sweeping the nation. So these kids started uh, doing these lunch counter sit-ins, like at the Woolworths here, and, and we have pictures of that in the collection. Um, but they were having very little success because what would happen is the lunch counter would just shut down or they would just shut down the entire restaurant. Okay. Oh. So that's how they would get around this. So... Also, what was happening now at UT, so you have to remember, UT had just become desegregated in terms of allowing African-American students to participate in classes, Brown versus Board, passed in 54. So this is like, you know, the mid to late 50s. Now UT is integrated, so you had African-Americans in class with everybody else. But what was happening was, so the students would get these assignments to uh, watch, go watch movies at both the Varsity and the Texas. Those were located on the drag. And that was part of the assignment that they had to do. The African-American students could not complete the assignments because they were not allowed to see those movies at those theaters. Oh. Wow. Right. So horrendous. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so um, they got this idea since the lunch counter sit in thing wasn't going well. They came up with this thing called the movie theater stand in approach, which was two twofold. Of course, they would uh, carry protest signs and they focused on the varsity and the Texas, Texas, because those were the two, you know, main theaters on the drag that that served the UT community right. at the time. And this is where those kids were getting those assignments for those movies um, to, to go to those um, It was a natural places. progression. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so they would carry picket signs, but what they would do is a group of them, both, you know, mixed white and African American, they would stand in line and each person would go up to the ticket counter and ask, does this theater um, sell tickets to all Americans. Of course, the ticket person would say no. So then that person would go to the back of the line and the next person would ask the same question. No. They'd go to the back of the line, thus jamming up the lines <laughs> and denying the theater's revenue. Nice. So that was the, <laughs> that was the approach. So this started in about 1960. Now, the movement really started picking up steam and, mo and momentum after, of all people, Eleanor Roosevelt caught wind of this. So in her mid-70s, she was still publishing a column, a nationally syndicated column called My Day. Um, and she, she caught wind of what these brave UT students were doing because they had invented this form mm -hmm. of protest. And um, she praised them in one of her columns, you know, calling them out and saying they were very courageous and brave for trying to end this type of discrimination. And um, that it really picked up steam after that. I was going to say, that gave them national yeah, support immediately. Yeah, it gave them national support. And soon these, these theater stand-ins were being emulated uh, nationwide. Um, another thing that was really cool around this time was a band of uh, faculty and staff at UT for the price of a theater ticket, all chipped in money and took out a ginormous ad in the Statesman asking the Varsity and the Texas to desegregate. 
Oh, wow. So that happened as well. Like a full page ad? Yeah. And they took and a it just full said, page ad. Just put them on blast. Yeah. Like, Let everyone in right. desegregation and each, now. Each, person, each person's name who Step stood Step up to the progressive this. level you're, the school you're exactly, serving. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Nice. So they did that as well. And I do not talk about that in the book. I just We just didn't have time. Arcadia has its ways, and we just mm-hmm. didn't have enough pages. So our listeners um, get an exclusive so you, little tidbit yeah. there. That's right. You get in your little tidbit there. <laughs> Um, so, um, that's, that's what they were doing and it really picked up steam after this. And so by September of 61, so that before that there was a kind of a standoff between those in support and those not in support on Abraham Lincoln's birthday, which was February of 61, where there was kind of a clash between protesters for and against. Mm. Um, There was a little bit of violence, not too much. It was publicized in the Statesman, and it may have gotten some national attention. But anyway, it was still picking up a lot of steam. And um, finally, by September of 61, both the owners of the Varsity and the Texas came to the table. And they said... 71. 61. Oh, 61. Excuse me. 61. And um, they said, okay, we'll give this a one-month trial. Um, So we'll only allow registered students, they have to, African-American students who have valid UTIDs to come and see movies for a month. And if we find that our revenue, our bottom line is not affected, we will Gross. desegregate the theaters. <laughs> wow. And sure enough, it went without a hitch. And in a month, they saw revenue was not affected. And boom, these theaters became desegregated. So in our research and in my own research in the archive, these are some of the first businesses in town to become desegregated in 61, three years before Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act in 1964. But most of the businesses along the drag after that, they weren't scared either anymore. So they they desegregated pretty quickly. And, yeah. you know, and then other theaters you changed town. the norm. You changed the moral exactly, aptitude. Exactly, right. exactly. So, that's great. I mean, we, yeah. we have... I had no idea. I mean, that's that's a part of our national history of civil rights. That's started right, and it right here started right here, Ground Zero Theater Stand and Movement. Man, there yeah. was some other big stuff that happened in theaters yes. on a national scale. We've we've had some premieres. I know that in the book, there's a picture of the at the beginning of the book. It's a picture of the premiere of the Batman movie. Yeah, taken on July 30th, 1966. Right. I think it's showing Burgess Meredith, right. who was playing the Penguin. Yeah. Waving in a parade. I mean, what's the story behind that photo? Yeah, so uh, it was awesome. This was, in my opinion, perhaps the greatest premiere here. It was really it, it, popular. Um, so this was um, this Saturday, July 30th, 1966. And I'll preface this by saying, too, that this was two days, two days before the UT Tower shooting. Oh, wow. So the city went from this high, el- one of elation. Yeah. Um, to just boom, you know, rock bottom. But getting back to the premiere here. <laughs> um, so what happened was a local company called Glastron had built the bat boat for the movie. Oh. So one of the um, stipulations was that if they're going to build the bat boat for the movie, they have to have the premiere here in Austin. But what was really cool was with this premiere, um, which, by the way, had both an adult and a child. They had a children's matinee in the afternoon and an adult thing at night, a gala, mm-hmm. uh, the first of its kind, supposedly so a, an ABC spokesman had said. Um, but it was huge. There were over 30,000 children and adults lined up to watch the cavalcade of their stars come down Congress Avenue, renamed Batman Boulevard for the day. <laughs> wow. But the proceeds for this entire thing went to benefit the Aqua Festival. Is that why all the bats moved to the bridge? <laughs> there you go. That's the reason why. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I could yeah. just, we could keep talking forever. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, we'll have to have you back on the show. This is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Really, I mean, really you've great. really yeah, part taught two. me some things. This is great. <laughs> great. I'm glad yeah. So, it. once again, the book is Historic Movie Houses of Austin, and it's available at the Austin History Center. Is that right? Through the association. Okay. The Austin um, History Center Association. That's right. And you can check it out of the 
library, or you can buy it on Amazon, and it's available at a lot of local book purveyors, including wherever book you find people. books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all over the place. Great. Well, thank you again, Susan. This was a really awesome. Thank you. This was fun. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, the Austin Public Library Radio Show. And next up, we're going to play an audio excerpt from the Austin History Center's 2015 behind-the-scenes documentary that highlights some of the work that they are doing. I've always kind of viewed history as it's like a tapestry with a lot of little threads. And each of those threads, there's are little stories. And if you remove those threads, you lose the tapestry. We need all those threads and we need all those stories so that current and future generations can understand what Austin was, is, and will be in the future. And we need a place to save that history. I'm Mike Miller, the manager of the Austin History Center. The Austin History Center is the local history division of the Austin Public Library, and we preserve the history of Austin and Travis County. We have some really fun and interesting things here. Letters, diaries, records, photographs, maps, books, video, audio, oral histories. This is a record of arrests. You have someone arrested for fast writing. And that's not fast riding as in writing, it was fast riding. So they were speeding on their horse through town. So one of the really cool things that we do here at the History Center is we build exhibits to display and celebrate Austin's history and to get more of the materials in these back stacks out to the public. Oh, Steve. Hey, Steve. Hi. What are we working on today? We're doing a series of photographs of the old bookmobiles from the Austin Public Library. These are voice recordings of Austinites. These are really important. A lot of people have not left a written record behind, and so to understand their history and their story, uh, we have to rely on uh, an oral tradition and an oral record. One of our more famous and kind of interesting stories is an interview that was done of Ann Richards. So I got a telephone call from a friend of mine that said that she had this young woman who wanted to run for office, and would I look at her and talk with her? I said I wouldn't take it with a 10 foot pole. We have about 50,000 square feet of materials in this building, and this building is only 33,000 square feet. We're waiting for our roof to pop and papers to just go fluttering out. These are some of our favorite uh, pieces. This is the suicide letter that Whitman wrote the night before he went up into the tower and, and started his shootings. A Marine veteran who was an expert marksman shot and killed 10 unsuspecting noontime strollers on the University of Texas campus today. And you can see it's both typed and handwritten. He went back and finished the letter in longhand after he killed his wife. All right, and now for my favorite place to work during the summer, it's our cold storage vault. This is where we protect photographic negatives and moving picture images. And so this is our inner vault. This is where we store nitrate negatives. Nitrate uh, can spontaneously combust if uh, too warm. Uh, this is why a lot of movie houses in the 20s burned down. Support comes from the College Destination Center at ACC, providing one-on-one -on -one help with admissions and enrollment, financial aid, career exploration, and degree planning. Just in time for fall registration. More at austincc.edu slash start now. Welcome back to Volumes, the Austin Public Library radio show. Before those brief announcements, we were listening to a very short excerpt from the Austin History Center's 2015 behind-the-scenes documentary, just a little taste of what the History Center does. The full video and a ton of other amazing videos are on the Austin History Center's YouTube channel. And their social media accounts, and including a link to that YouTube channel, can be found at library.austintexas.gov slash social. That's right. Thanks again to Susan Redreiser for joining us today. Next week, we'll talk to Kathleen Houlihan, James Loomis, Gabriel Ransenberg, and Jessica Hank of Echo and the Bats, the Austin Public Library's all-youth librarian band. Da -da -da! <laughs> Additional information about the Austin Public Library can be found at library.austintexas.gov. And Peace, everybody. Oh, I think uh, Kanye wants to say something. Starting on Wednesday, June 7th, volumes will be broadcast over the airwaves at 2.30 in the afternoon on 91.7 FM Co-op Radio. That's right, y'all. We're moving. Peace. 
Thanks for listening to Volumes, the Austin Public Library radio show. Details at library.austintexas.gov slash volumes. Want to give a special thanks to our audio engineer, DJ Harris, and our volunteer production assistant, Sev Corson. And thanks to the musicians who composed and performed our original theme song, Andrew Noble on violin, Kirk Duvall on guitar, and APL's very own Mike Wheat on percussion. Volumes, the Austin Public Library radio show, airs Wednesdays at 7 p.m. on koop.org community radio.